Um, so what can we expect in the next few years as, um, as the personalized chatbot plus the plus the, the robot or the, or the virtual reality becomes more and more sophisticated. Well, I suspect as some middle term consequences, um, we might expect at least, even if we're not immediately prepared to say that such and such individual um, actually lives past their death date, we might soon start seeing arrangements where people place in their will, for example, that they would like their personalized chatbot self to go on making investment decisions um, for their estate. Right? Why not? Right? If if the if the AI can reliably make decisions of the sort that the living person it represents would have made, then it seems like very soon um, people will ha will will start demanding um, the legal right to be represented by their postmortem um, personalized AI. Welcome to this Studium Generale lecture. Thank you for coming. It's great to see you in this room. My name is Jaap Janssen and I'm program maker at Studium Generale. And Studium Generale is a department of the university that organizes lectures, debates, lecture series, film and talk events, cultural uh, evenings, um, yeah, on all kinds of uh, different topics. And the guest lecturer of tonight, and I'm very honored and delighted to introduce him to you, is Professor Justin Smith Ruyu. And I would like to thank you for coming to Maastricht all the way from Paris. Thank you. <laughs> and Justin Smith Ruyu is an American Canadian professor of philosophy at the Department of uh, History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Paris. And his research, uh, uh, his research includes, his research in interest includes Leibniz, post-structuralism, early modern philosophy, and even, but that was some time ago, Indian philosophy. <laughs> and um, he has written a lot of books. I will name two, Against the Algorithm, Human Freedom in a Data-Driven Age. And of course, the internet is not what you think it is. And that's his latest uh, book. And that was actually the occasion, the reason to invite him to Maastricht. And, um, but he also regularly publishes in magazines such as the New York Times, uh, Harper's Magazine and Slate, and he has his own Substack newsletter called the Internet. Internet yes. The Internet. And there is even an asteroid named after him, if, if I'm co <laughs> correctly informed. So maybe he's going to talk about that as well. <laughs> I'm very curious why that is, but uh, that's off topic. And tonight he's going to talk about the Homo Virtualis. And he's going to explore with us what the implications are of outsourcing more and more of our life, of our physical life, of our daily life, to, to the digital realm, to the, to the likes and the views and the clicks and the tweets and the algorithms of the internet. And uh, well, the lecture one hour and uh, after the lecture we have half an hour for questions and discussions. The floor is yours, Mr. Smith. Give him applause, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. It's my first time in Maastricht, and it's a lovely place, and I appreciate your coming this evening uh, in this fine weather to sit in this auditorium and listen to me for an hour or so, and then I suppose we'll have a half hour or so for uh, general discussion. Um, so. What I have to talk about tonight is not very carefully planned. It's spontaneous. I think I know more or less where I want to go, 
but somewhat as stand-up comedians do, I'm trying out new material tonight, and I don't know how it will go exactly. Um, this material is departing from, that is to say starting from, but also leaving behind, what I wrote in this 2022 book, The Internet Is Not What You Think It Is. There are many things, as often happens when one writes a book, one really only begins to understand what one was trying to say after the reviews start coming in, and one's able to think, oh yes, that's what I meant. Um, and so the afterlife of the book is an occasion to come to venues like this one and to talk through problems that are only uh, nascent or uh, incipient in, uh, in the, the book itself. So that's what I'd like to do tonight. And indeed, since I submitted the manuscript, which is now, say, two and a half years ago or so, a lot of new stuff has gone down. That's a long time in our technological reality. For one thing, there has been a significant new, uh, you could almost say revolution, the latest revolution in artificial intelligence, which um, has given new life to some problems that were only addressed passingly in the book. Um, so we're going to be talking about some of those problems. We're also going to be working, and you know, as a scholar, I am somewhat hesitant to uh, wade into the murky, vaguely pseudo-scholarly world of what's sometimes called futurology. Um, you can't study the future, it hasn't happened yet, and futurologists are basically systematically universally wrong, and you can study that because what they said is now in the past. Um, People like Ray Kurzweil, for example, um, the, the, the well-known singularity theorist who periodically has to update his projection in the future of when the rise of uh, machine consciousness is going to really start. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's been giving us predictions since the 1970s and somewhat like a millenarian cult leader, he has to continually say, okay, no, it's actually coming a few more years down the line. So I don't wanna do any of that. I don't wanna do, uh, let's say, vulgar futurology. I do, however, want to try to summon my resources, mostly as a philosopher, but also as a long time kind of uh, amateur uh, or outside reader of anthropological uh, scholarship in order to try to get a grip on what might be coming in the next de decade or so. What might be coming, these are not predictions, these are uh, uh, efforts to explore the range of possibilities, right? Um, and what might be coming will be substantially shaped by the direction technology continues to develop. And again, uh, this is a direction that I don't think was entirely clear to me even uh, at the moment I submitted the manuscript for this book that, um, that I've already uh, evoked. So, that's a little bit of a kind of uh, general roadmap of where we're going. But let's start with some, you could say, anthropological basics. Um, this is a screenshot from last year's uh, French tax return for me. Um, it tells you what my civil state is. It tells you my family name and my, uh, my given name in that order, as always happens in French official documents. It tells you the 
family name under which I was born, and it tells you the date and place of my birth. And that date in particular, the place is important too in, I think, most modern European bureaucracies, but the DOB, as we call it in the United States, is really important. It's an identifying um, sequence of numbers. It's a numerical code for uh, uniquely picking out individual human beings. There it is again on my passport. Um, it's what makes anyone absolutely certain that they've got me and not some other um, person who has the same name as I do. Though my name, as we've already discussed, is a complicated matter because it keeps changing. Um, so that's a problem for the bureaucracies and that creates problems for me as a living human being. Interesting fact about modern life. Someone went and made a um, Wikipedia page for me in Dutch. Um, it gives um, my old name the name I used to go by, and again, it gives my date of birth and some kind of description of me. What it doesn't give, obviously, well, maybe obviously, this is the kind of thing philosophers like to dwell on, sounds so obvious, why is he saying it? What it doesn't give is a date of death, right? Why not? Well, oops, went too far. Why not? Well, because obviously I'm not dead yet. Um, notice October 3rd when I went and I made this screenshot early this, uh, this morning, um, didn't have any entries yet. I suspect if you go back to Wikipedia right now and check, October 3rd has some recent deaths, right? Why does this matter? Um, why am I dwelling on this? Why is this a, a, a starting point? Well, I want to make a bold contention that these vital statistics, these records, that are kind of what frame our lives are not necessarily the boundaries of our moral personhood. That is to say, the span of time in which we uh, count as persons in the fullest sense. Date of birth and date of death have for the past few hundred years, admittedly, in many uh, bureaucratically administered modern societies, been pretty firm barriers for being able to be considered as a morally relevant individual person. But it hasn't always been the case, and I want to conjecture as a result of our new technologies, it might, again, not be the case. We might, that is to say, be able, in important respects, to survive our own deaths as persons, right? Um, now, there's a, 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 somewhere Woody Allen wrote, um, uh, I don't want to live on in my works, I want to live on in my apartment. Right? And obviously, what you're probably thinking is, come on, nobody can actually survive death. Um, and what I want to, and certainly not through something as shabby as books or movies, what I want to say is that it might be that new technologies are going to turn out to be different from books and movies and written traces and all those other things that kind of, in a kind of derivative way, some people have hoped to live on in, right? All right, what do I mean when I say it has not always been this way? Here's, well, here's where I think some anthropology will do us a bit of good. Many cultures around the world, historically, and even today to some extent, cultures that are less loyal to the official documents of bureaucratic administrative states, um, take them less seriously than we do as good um, kind of uh, properly signed up students at the University of Maastricht at, or whatever. Um, many cultures around the world have been perfectly comfortable recognizing, for example, that uh, their deceased ancestors remain in the fullest sense 
part of the family um, for at least seven years after their deaths. And this obligates family members to perform a number of rituals over the course of those years uh, to uh, um, clean their gravestone, even in some cases, I'm drawing this example from the Balkans, um, digging up their, uh, their remains and washing their bones and things like this. And the, these are things that are done for the deceased, right? Not in memory of the deceased, but for the deceased as people who are, so to speak, um, ongoing, post-mortem social actors, you might say, right? Um, and this is particularly the case, I think, in cultures around the world. And here's, a, I think, an important uh, criterion of demarcation in our cultures, I think in the Netherlands as well, I'm confident in saying in the Netherlands as well, um, we tend to celebrate above all our birthdays. What is a birthday? It's the day on which uh, the state uh, 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 issues that numerical code, your DOB, on your passport and your birth certificate and so on that serves as an identifying number for the rest of your life. Is that the only thing you might celebrate? No. Again, we can look for examples from the Balkans, from the Orthodox world in particular, where at least traditionally, um, a celebration of you as an individual that's more important than your birthday is your name day, right? That is to say, the day on which the saint after whom you were named is celebrated. And traditionally, in many societies, people will know their name day very well, and they'll get presents and maybe a cake and things like that on their name day. They might not even know when their birthday is, right? Um, so on such a conception of who you are as a moral person, if you are George, let's say, you are in some sense um, an iteration of the latest uh, kind of, uh, the latest, uh, how should I put it, the latest, yeah, the latest iteration of St. George, um, first and foremost. You're not you, singular, George, the guy with that date of birth. You see the difference? Um, so uh, I've given you the example of, let's say, uh, uh, rituals for deceased ancestors, the example of societies that recognize uh, name days rather than uh, birthdays. Um, so, and you know, you can extend this out even further. Many Native American societies tend to conceptualize our moral commitments to other persons seven generations backwards and forwards, right? So, in other words, um, your ancestors. Seven, up to seven generations ago and your descendants up to seven generations from now are uh, relevant uh, moral persons in the field of your social action, right? Does that make sense? Um, so again, we think uh, we know where the boundaries of moral personhood are. They can actually change, right? Um, uh, uh, and what I want to explore tonight, again, taking a circuitous path to get there um, is the possibility that new technologies might have an impact on uh, our um, pretty solid understanding over the past few centuries of the ultimate boundaries of your moral personhood lying at your birth date and your death date. Does that make sense? Um, all right, so part of the background, and let me now talk about the background uh, uh, kind of theoretical uh, resources that I'm drawing on. I don't wanna go too deep into the theoretical weeds, but I, I do want to tell you where I'm coming from. Um, I'm a great admirer of the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, um, who in the late 1980s wrote a magnificent work called Sources of the Self, which is in the vein of what you could call philosophical anthropology, right? It's a work trying to um, 
tease out um, in particular the uh, anthropological dimensions of the, uh, let's say, the, the emergence of the modern world um, that, that left us with the philosophical commitments that we have about, for example, what a moral person is, what a self is, right? Um, and he is, I won't read you the whole quote, but he's reasonably uh, 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 prepared to acknowledge that in some sense, um, all human beings in all places and times have grasped um, that, you know, I'm me and you're you, and that's a big difference, and, uh, and my meanness is uh, contingent on my not getting trampled by the woolly mammoth we're hunting, right? For example, <laughs> this is Charles Taylor's example. That is to say that, you know, uh, uh, even if in some sense, uh, we can do a uh, genealogy in Michel Foucault's style of, um, of the, the distinctly modern notion of the individual. In some other sense, um, um, we're pretty much constrained, just given the way our brains evolved, um, to think of ourselves as, as, as me and not you, and to think of that meanness rather than you-ness as rooted in, um, in uh, the continuation of our lives. In some sense, right? But Taylor's very good at this because what he always wants to say is, yes, in some sense, but there's a lot more going on. Um, and Taylor is, I don't know how, uh, uh, how immersed um, you all have been uh, in, uh, 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 or how, how much you've been exposed to the work of Michel Foucault, uh, but uh, Foucault kind of gives us the limit case of um, uh, the, the theory of the individual self as a uh, simple byproduct of, um, of uh, conventions that emerge in um, the modern world. In my 2015 uh, book on the origins of the concept of uh, racial difference in, um, uh, in early modern Europe, or in early modern Europe and its encounter uh, with the rest of the world through its colonial expansion, um, I briefly reflect on this, and again, I won't read the entire um, passage, uh, but uh, on the idea that a lot of what makes it possible to dehumanize another person um, is indeed uh, precisely uh, the emergence of different administrative practices uh, in relation to those persons. So um, if you are in a culture where a certain class of people uh, is habitually bought and sold, whereas another class of people um, is habitually celebrated for its birthdays or its name days, um, this creates uh, an a posteriori moral distinction that seems self-evident, right? Um, and so obviously thinking about the emergence of uh, racial uh, classification um, is in some sense a more fine-grained uh, and specific question than the emergence of the concept of person or individual, as I've been putting it, and you know the terminology is fluid, but I've been saying moral personhood. I think that's the one I'm gonna stick with. Um, uh, the question of the emergence of racial classification is narrower, but in both cases, I think if you can, you can work your way into a perspective where um, uh, the, the perception of uh, morally a uh, relevant individual is contingent on the emergence of certain, or the emergence or the, the settling in, you might say, of certain uh, uh, what I'm calling administrative practices, right? Like, like maintaining vital statistics or records of sale, things like that. These are things, uh, as I note in this passage, which I'm not reading, but you're free to read. Um, uh, while you're also listening to me, um, is that, for example, this is something we don't do with most animals, right? We don't um, keep uh, rigorous records of birth and death um, for uh, livestock um, or 
for, for, uh, for domestic animals. And we might think that uh, the, the direction of causation, we, t we tend to think that the, the direction of causation is that we recognize that these are not morally relevant beings and therefore they're not worthy of rigorous record keeping. It might be precisely the reverse, right? You follow me? Um, it might be that we don't recognize them as morally relevant beings because we aren't keeping rigorous records about them, right? Um, and these records, I want to emphasize, if you're like, why is this guy talking about vital statistics paperwork bureaucracies um, when he's supposed to be talking about the internet? Well, the answer is that, um, that that's a technology too. That's obviously a technology. And in fact, if you, if you look at the broad sweep of millennia or tens of millennia of human technological innovation, once you've got bureaucratic record keeping, um, electronic record keeping and surveillance and so on happens like practically the next day, right? In the broad historical sweep, right? The next day meaning like, you know, a century or two later. Right. Um, all right. So uh, uh, that's some of the kind of deep in the weeds, heavy uh, theoretical stuff. I, I'm hoping now to be able to start moving uh, closer to the familiar ter territory of digital technology. In order to do this, I want to um, inv evoke the work of um, Dave Chalmers, uh, who's, uh, whom you, you might know. Um, uh, uh, he's a, a prominent Australian philosopher um, based in uh, New York uh, who is uh, most known um, for the so-called hard problem of consciousness that he uh, developed in the 1990s. Um, I wrote a perhaps excessively critical, uh, lengthy uh, review of his most recent book called Reality Plus. Um, which, as the name suggests, um, is an attempt to take seriously um, what is sometimes called the simulation argument as propounded by people like Nick Bostrom and then given the thumbs up by people like Elon Musk and Bill Gates, the idea that the nature of reality itself um, coincidentally happens to look, be, I should say, a lot like um, the latest uh, computing technologies that we've developed over the past century. <laughs> Remarkable coincidence, um, but that's, that's the argument. Reality itself um, is something more like virtual reality than like, say, a 19th century physicist thought it was. As Chalmers likes to say, reality is more bit-like than it-like, right? Um, but I want to focus on, on another part of uh, Chalmers' work where he's actually, I mean, Chalmers is an interesting character because he um, is very much more willing to engage with um, the prevailing strands of uh, intellectual output from, uh, let's say, Silicon Valley um, tech culture, right? Um, typically, academic philosophers want to, don't want to get their hands dirty, um, don't want to get anywhere close to the tech bros, right? That's, that's just a different world. And, uh, you know, they might have good, uh, good uh, reasons for doing that. In many respects, academic philosophers are more sophisticated, <laughs> I'll dare to say. Um, on the other hand, if you don't engage with the preva prevailing ideas of your era, then you're probably missing something, right? And Chalmers is um, definitely to be commended for, um, for, uh, uh, ac for approaching as an academic philosopher um, the, 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 the ideas that people like Elon Musk cares about. Again, whereas most academic philosophers tend to say, Elon Musk, he doesn't know what he's talking about, right? Um, the, does that mean that he might be right? Well, everyone might be right, but you know, in addition to being right, there's, there's also the question of being influential. And you know, it seems, to, seems that in engaging, for example, uh, with Ray Kurzweil's singularity uh, argument, again, the singularity argument that Kurzweil's been pushing since the 1970s is that at some moment, uh, technological uh, silicone-based evolution will surpass um, carbon-based evolution as the most important uh, 
process in uh, Earth history, you might say, right? We'll pass from biological evolution to technological evolution, and technology is going to, so to speak, take over once the robots begin self-replicating and, and, um, and doing everything that we used to think was characteristic only of living systems, right? I, I, I could say a lot more about it, but that's sufficient for now. Anyhow, it's in that it's that part of Chalmers' work, uh, the part where he, he's trying to take seriously Kurzweil's argument for the singularity, that, I'm, that it's from that part of Chalmers' work that I'm drawing my example right now. So uh, Chalmers um, invokes the figure of Digidave um, as opposed to Biodave, that is to say, um, Bio Dave is the is the is the Dave Chalmers living in um, meat space as as they say sometimes um, the regular old biological Dave Chalmers. Um, Digi Dave is um, the successfully uploaded version of Dave Chalmers' consciousness onto some hard drive or other. Right, um, and this possibility consciousness uploading. Um, I could say a lot about this. It involves um, significant theoretical commitments in philosophy of mind. Um, that is to say, certain very important things have to be true in order for consciousness uploading to be possible. Um, and uh, philosophers like Bostrom, whom I've already evoked, Nick Bostrom, tend to just take it for granted that, that, these, that these things are true. Um, uh, most importantly, uh, philosophers who are interested in consciousness uploading tend to take it for granted that, um, that consciousness is substrate neutral. That is to say, our consciousness happens to be instantiated in a carbon-based substrate of 100 billion neurons. Um, it could have just as easily been string and toilet paper rolls, to, to, to use the example we often hear, or it could have just, just as easily been microchips, right? Something silicon-based, or it could have just as easily been appropriately arranged hydrogen atoms or you know, anything at all, right? Um, and I'll just say um, it's my firm commitment for reasons that I won't argue for tonight um, that, uh, that this is by no means a settled question, as far as I can tell. Um, there are philosophers like Daniel Dennett, um, whom uh, you, you've probably heard of, um, who think that, uh, that there's something very specific about evolved biological systems that facilitates consciousness that you can't just go and build with wires and microchips, right? Even if wires and microchips can do other really impressive things, um, uh, you have to pass through hundreds of millions of years of biological evolution to get, get what the AI developers seem to think you can, you can get in a few decades, right? Um, anyhow, that's a whole, a whole different issue. I just want to evoke the, the figure of Digidave or DigiU for all of you here, the idea of consciousness uploading. Now, Generally, we tend to think that if we could upload our consciousness, we could truly survive death, right? Um, that would be uh, to rout the Grim Reaper, right? Um, um, you come along to take my biological body, well, you're out of luck because I'm already in my hard drive or in the cloud, right? Um, but again, uh, this, this, this recalls um, the, um, the Woody Allen line, um, we tend also to think that we're really only there, like they're there, um, not uh, only if um, all of the information that, that constitutes us is there, there, but also if we're really there and feeling it, right? There and knowing it, right? There and thinking, ha ha, I cheated death, I'm in the cloud now, right? Um, now, what I want to suggest is that that, um, um, that that criterion that Woody Allen evoked um, um, looks really important to us because we're attached to our individual uh, uh, 
uh, biological uh, 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 duration of the sort that's measured by vital statistics offices. But again, it hasn't always been that way and it doesn't have to always be that way. So my primary contention, um, my principal contention that I'm trying to work towards this evening is that unlike Chalmers, I contend that we might be mistaken in supposing that survival of personhood requires survival of consciousness, whether in a digital or a biological substrate. The transition to the digital, moreover, might well turn out to obviate what you might call the consciousness condition that we have long, but not always, associated with personhood, right? Um, um, that is to say, we might be able to imagine a future in which we are sufficiently uploaded, but not as enduring conscious subjectivities, not as continuous nodes of personal identity of the sort that would satisfy a philosopher like John Locke, um, simply in virtue of the fact that our uploaded version of us keeps doing the stuff that we recognize as our stuff, right? As, 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 as the kind of things we as living individuals do. In other words, when Woody Allen lives on in his books and movies, those are just static, they just sit there, right? But technology might afford new possibilities where the uploaded version, or um, if you wanna get more kind of, onto more familiar territory than, than uploaded personhood, we can talk about um, personalized chatbots, and I'll get there soon enough. Um, the personalized chatbot or the personalized AI that's, that's running your personality might get so good that it will continue doing you-like things even without your consciousness. And when that starts to happen, I suggest, again, I'm not a futurologist, I could be wrong, I just wanna say this is in the range of possibilities, um, we might start rethinking um, what we take to be um, uh, uh, the criteria of moral personhood, right? Does that make sense? Um, all right, so a, a bit more uh, into the weeds. A uh, very interesting um, uh, philosopher I, I admire a great deal, Susan Schneider, um, who's, uh, among other things, a NASA consultant on questions of xenobiology or astro, astrobiology. Um, the, why do we need philosophers um, for that? I mean, most astrobiology is just looking for chemical traces in the atmospheres of exoplanets that suggest, you know, methane emissions that that are associated on Earth with um, with 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 biological um, uh, life. Um, Things like that, we found phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus a few years ago, you might recall, and that got people really excited for a while. So why do we need philosophers? Well, in part we need philosophers because um, nobody's really clear on what intelligence actually is. Um, nobody's clear on what, an in what can count as an intelligent system. Um, and uh, nobody's really clear, therefore, on what we're looking for when we're looking for signs of intelligent life in the universe, right? Um, we usually conflate the search for, in, well, intelligent, uh, I, I, I shouldn't say conflate, we usually just assume that those two go together, intelligent and life, right? Um, uh, it's almost a kind of, what's the term, a solecism, where you, you, uh, you say the same thing over again, right? Um, in fact, what what Schneider wants to say is no, we might well find intelligence without life, right? Why? Well, because it might be a pretty predictable pattern um, in the history of intelligence wherever it 
may emerge in the cosmos, that it passed through a very, very brief period of biological consciousness before moving on to unconscious technological intelligence, right? Um, in other words, as she puts it, on cosmological scales, consciousness may be a blip, a momentary flowering of experience before the universe reverts to mindlessness, right? So what she she's imagining is a Kurzweil-like scenario in which um, uh, carbon-based entities evolve on some exoplanet. They start building machines. These machines get really good at doing the things that those carbon-based beings used to do. And then eventually, you know, as the AI millenarians or apocalypticists are saying, um, the, the machines they built kill them all off and then keep doing what they're doing in a very effective way, right? And so we might well expect then that the first encounter we have with an intelligent system out there in the cosmos is going to be with um, technologically uh, technological entities, um, but uh, no uh, biological entities associated with them because they've all died off or been killed off, right? Um, that's what we should be looking for, Schneider says, not for little green aliens, right? Um, not for reptilians, right? Interesting idea. Um, I'm not gonna, I mean, uh, uh, Schneider is working within the realm of possibility. Unlike Kurzweil, she's not, she's not boldly speculating on what must be true. She's inviting us to think about things um, in a more capacious way. Maybe that's the difference between philosophy and futurology as a, again, as a, as a pseudo scholarly endeavor. Um, all right, so this, um, if I can put in a word for Leibniz, this idea of intelligence without consciousness. I mean, what is intelligence exactly? Um, well, uh, already in the 17th century, we have plenty of people who are saying um, that the only thing that counts as distinctly human, the only thing, or let's say distinctly characteristic of an entity with moral personhood, for Leibniz it might be a human, but it might also be an angel or an archangel or something like that, um, the only thing that counts, uh, that, that's, that's uniquely characteristic of such entities is conscious perception, not intelligence, right? In fact, a good portion of what we call intelligence, Leibniz thinks, can be, uh, so to speak, outsourced to machines, right? Just, just put it in the machine and let, let the machine do the, your drudging arithmetic. Arithmetic isn't worthy of a conscious, morally relevant individual person, um, and if we can get machines to do it, why not, right? Um, and of course, this is Leibniz's tremendous optimism. He's the true godfather of the internet, as I argue in the 2022 book. Um, he saw it all coming. Well, he saw almost all of it coming. He saw the good part coming. <laughs> um, he didn't see uh, the, dis the, the, the dystopian consequences. Leibniz famously um, uh, said that someday uh, in the near future, uh, when two empires are about to go to war, they can just declare calculemus, let us calculate, and then they can feed in their various commitments of each of the two empires to a machine, like one that looks like this one, kind of, and then the machine will give you like some ticker tape like output that will tell you which of the two emperors is right, right? And then that will be winning the war, right? In other words, outsourcing our deliberate, our rational deliberative processes, Leibniz thought would bring about perpetual world peace, right? Now, obviously he was dead wrong uh, uh, about that, right? We've got the internet he envisioned and it ain't bringing about world peace, right? <laughs> On the contrary. Um, so Leibniz is fascinating for this reason because again, again he's, he's, um, he's envisioning all of this at a time when one would have had very good reason for optimism. As I argue in the 2022 book, you could say that in effect, uh, there are uh, two 
chapters to the history of the internet. One extends from, as I would put it, 1678 to about 2011, and the other extends from 2011 to today, right? Why do I put it 2011? Well, that's around the time of the various um, Twitter revolutions, um, the so-called Arab Spring, where people were, and I remember this very clearly, saying wildly excessive things about how, uh, how uh, powerful Twitter was going to be for facilitating facilitating peaceful revolutionary change, right? And then it just collapsed into a bloodbath a few months later, or even less, and that was kind of the, the when I, maybe I, I, was, I was late to notice this, but that was when I first started thinking, hey, wait, maybe this isn't working out so well, right? Um, anyhow, Leibniz didn't live to see that. Um, so he just gives us the, the, the rosy side of it. What I want to emphasize is that this idea um, of intelligent but non-conscious systems that Susan Schneider says might be characteristic of the entire, uh, you know, might be the general rule um, uh, for intelligence throughout the universe um, uh, is already uh, very present in, um, in the 17th century. It's, and, and, and again, the distinction between consciousness and intelligence is, um, is perfectly clear to Leibniz. I think, I think many people who write about the singularity and about, broad, more broadly speaking, the philosophy of artificial intelligence tend to run these two together. Schneider doesn't, she's an exception. Um, Kurzweil and others, as far as I can tell, tend to take for granted uh, that, um, that strong artificial intelligence, a, a, an artificial system that can execute all of the tasks that a human being executes is ipso facto conscious, right? Um, again, that requires a separate argument, and there are many good reasons to think, as Sh Susan Schneider thinks, that you can have strong artificial intelligence with nothing going on in there, right? No, no qualia, no um, internal uh, subjective states, no phenomenology, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, all right, uh, so I, I wanna try to move ahead uh, as, as, as far as I can. Um, I, I think I'm gonna skip a, a few of my slides if, if you'll permit me. Now, I wanna talk for maybe a few minutes about um, the contemporary moment, some of the themes, I, I think of chapter two of the 2022 book, where um, uh, uh, ideal, in passing anyway, with, with a question that a lot of people, including James Williams, have, have dealt with in more detail, which is the so-called crisis of attention um, and uh, the, the concerns that you know, we're all familiar with, every parent is familiar with, about um, the, the um, uh, warping and damaging effects um, of new technologies for our ability to focus on anything, and this becomes especially serious um, when you think, as many philosophers do, such as William James, not James Williams, but William James, um, that attention is crucial to moral personhood. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, the idea is that attend, being able to attend to something like a work of art, for example, um, being able to stand in front of a tableau for, um, for an hour and let it reveal its secrets to you um, is, uh, is an ability that, um, that is in, that is necessary to anything like a moral or sentimental education in the, in, in the good old sense, right? And um, this is something that is drastically impeded um, by such technologies as the, as the news feed, right? So this is all very familiar. What we have here is a kind of um, uh, worry about a fragmentation of the self into countless or innumerable um, little bits of information that don't don't build up to any um, any um, solid solid sense of who one is oneself, right? In the way that, say, an aesthetic education, um, in the way someone like Friedrich Schiller concedes it would have been able to do for us. Um, 
All right, so that's one side of what's happening in the current moment, and one, one side of the crisis that's already familiar to us, that's been familiar to us you know, for at least, I don't know, uh, I started worrying about it around 2011, um, but again, I think it's only because I was, I was particularly uh, impervious or clueless before that, and other people were certainly noticing it earlier. Um, I mean, Norbert, Norbert Wiener, the, the, gr the great cybernetician was already noticing some of these concerns in the in the 1950s so you know it's it's hard to say when this problem became the problem we re we all recognize it as today now there are other dimensions of this as well um, the self is fragmented, but also the relationship to others is fragmented, for better or worse. Now, there's a strong argument that giving uh, Alzheimer's patients or people suffering from dementia um, uh, algorithmically, uh, heuristically trained um, uh, uh, cute stuffed animals to keep them company is uh, net good, right? Um, it really does uh, help cure their depression and feelings of isolation and anxiety, right? There's just no question about this. The tests show that it works, right? Are these people being tricked? Well, um, uh, they are indeed entering into relations with um, with semblances of other moral persons um, um, because, because actual moral persons are not available, right? Um, but what we're also finding is that this uh, sort of phenomenon um, is, uh, is hard to, um, let's say, rein in once it starts happening in um, Alzheimer's uh, care clinics um, or uh, senior citizens' homes, it's also happening um, um, in different ways um, among teenagers and, and um, among, uh, in broader society. And I think by now we're all familiar with this trope. Um, uh, I don't remember what year it came out, probably around 2011. Also, the Spike Jones film, Her, um, with Joaquin Phoenix and the, the, the story of the man who falls in love with the Siri-like um, digital personal assistant. And in some respects, this is, a, this is not a new trope, right? Um, you can also fall in love with a painting or, um, or uh, uh, a sculpture or, uh, you know, this is something that, that, this is a trope that to some extent um, has its, um, has its ancestors in, in pre-modern lore, um, but the technologies are also making it more than just lore, right? Um, uh, and it's becoming a structuring force in society. Uh, about a year ago, I was invited to a conference in Paris um, uh, that brought together researchers in artificial intelligence and robotics, some of whom were on an advisory panel for the French government on anticipating uh, uh, troubling new trends that could have consequences for, um, for let's say, the, the, the cohesion of society, including uh, 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 problems as severe as declining fertility rates, right? If, if it really does become possible to fall in love with your, um, your digital personal assistant and new social norms emerge that encourage that, then uh, one thing you can expect to happen is for the, for the fertility rate to go down, right? It to go down even more drastically than it already is in the developed world. Um, and so this is troubling. Interestingly, one thing that was emphasized um, uh, uh, at, this, uh, at this meeting in Paris is that um, Western European uh, governments are significantly more concerned about these, um, these, uh, these new trends than, for example, um, 
uh, 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 the, their, their counterparts in, say, South Korea or Japan, and we're seeing very bold new uh, innovations in, let's say, replacing real-world affective or empathetic attachments uh, to other moral persons through technologies. And this was big news in 2020 when a South Korean mother was given a virtual reality reunion with her deceased daughter. So uh, government panels in France are uh, uh, actively working to, um, to prevent this from becoming a widespread social norm um, and are concerned also that in other parts of the world um, not enough is being done. And this, this might be an interesting uh, moment for or uh, a case, topic for uh, what's sometimes called experimental philosophy in the, in the new contemporary sense, looking at the way different cultural commitments across the world having to do with what counts as a person, what counts as an individual might shape different technological practices, for example, in South Korea as opposed to France as opposed to the United States, right? I can't say anything a priori, but it could be a, an interesting field for study. Um, all right, I, I want to try to move to some of my speculative um, uh, 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 conjectures about where where things might be going on, on, on the on the basis of these examples. I, I already evoked um, uh, uh, the personalized chatbot technology, and I, I haven't done this myself, and I, 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 I closed my Twitter account um, basically the same day I submitted my book manuscript, um, and my life improved significantly. I got addicted, um, just like kind of an undercover cop who takes heroin, you know, I, I went in to like, like look like I was a, you know, uh, uh, I went deep, let's say, um, in order to understand the dynamics of social media. And, um, and, I, and, and I found it like closing Twitter was a real uh, uh, disintoxication process for me. But while I was on Twitter, um, I, 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 until 2021, I, I, I did know a lot of people who had customized chatbots that were, that were programmed to sound like them, right? As like a parallel account that they ran. And you know, often I couldn't tell the difference, right? So, um, and here I have just one example of um, a recent article I've read on how to use more sophisticated um, uh, uh, algorithmic tools for um, for uh, uh, drawing out aspects of personality and habits of expression and so on from a person's online um, traces that will uh, generate from those traces a more convincing chatbot version of them, right? Um, and so in the coming years, we can only expect this to get better and better, and we can expect virtual reality and robotics to, um, uh, to flesh out, so to speak, um, the, uh, the expressive dimensions of the chatbots, right? And this is, this is Daniel Dennett's recent preoccupation. Um, uh, uh, doesn't matter if, um, if robots if, or if AI systems will ever become conscious or not. That's the wrong question. The right question is, um, is um, uh, how to ensure that we don't keep pushing across the so-called uncanny valley um, at, to arrive at a point where, um, where we will be able to um, uh, mistakenly invest with moral relevance entities that in fact lack it, right? And so he uh, has been arguing that, um, that um, it's fine to keep developing AI, um, but it needs to be outlawed immediately. Um, it, what needs to be outlawed immediately is, um, is is putting sophisticated AI in humanoid um, robots, right? Because because that 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 um, that deteriorates um, that has a deteriorating effect in um, uh, 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 relations between actually morally re relevant individual human beings. Um, 
But the technology is certainly there, and it's pretty hard to see how world, at a global scale, there can be consistent legislation that would really stop it from slipping through, right? Um, so what can we expect in the next few years as, um, as the personalized chatbot plus the plus the, the robot or the, or the virtual reality becomes more and more sophisticated. Well, I suspect as some middle term consequences, um, we might expect at least, even if we're not immediately prepared to say that such and such individual um, actually lives past their death date, we might soon start seeing arrangements where people place in their will, for example, that they would like their personalized chatbot self to go on making investment decisions um, for their estate. Right? Why not? Right? If if the if the AI can reliably make decisions of the sort that the living person it represents would have made, then it seems like very soon um, people will ha will will start demanding um, the legal right to be represented by their postmortem um, personalized AI. Right? Um, in invest in 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 let's say, uh, post-mortem, posthumous fi financial matters, right? So that's, that's one way. But where you've got, um, where you've got the estates of the deceased um, uh, change, in, you know, transforming, also inevitably you're going to have transformations in the idea of what it is to be a widow, right, or a widower. And this will also have significant impact on uh, what we take marriage to be and what we take the, the marriage rights of a widow or a widower to be, for example, right? Um, a real um, significant um, uh, consequences of, um, of, 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 of these new technologies. Another one, maybe a bit further out, but, uh, but perfectly conceivable if um, things like inheritance and, uh, and marriage are already, um, are already uh, subject to such, such, such transformations in a brave new world, then Oops, why not also voting rights, right? If you can have um, uh, 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 your, your AI representative, your uploaded self, um, uh, continue to make um, decisions of the sort that you would make um, if you were not biologically dead, um, and if um, uh, uh, you, if we, shift to an understanding of, let's say, the scope of our interest in, let's say, political matters or the well-being of our descendants going out two, three, up to seven generations, like in many Native American societies, then it might seem perfectly reasonable to demand that my, uh, my personalized um, AI uh, or my uploaded self, um, again, non-conscious but uploaded self, have the right to vote in my place for the next two, three, four, up, who knows how long, generations, right? Um, and so on. I, we could probably make a much longer list. Maybe some other people will have some other ideas about where this might be going. But uh, just a final thought, I realize I'm over time now. Uh, the final question is, um, uh, how would this be granted? Would this be granted automatically? Um, 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 and it seems to me that, um, that here, uh, what we're more likely to see, given my, in contrast with Leibniz, general pessimism about how these things go, is a new um, vector of, um, of social and economic inequality, where people will soon be able to buy the right to vote uh, in a posthumous fashion, while other people will be excluded from that and other similar privileges, right? Um, so the technology, again, is basically already there, and I suspect it's only a matter of time um, before the, um, the, the, the social and political transformations um, uh, that, it, um, that it threatens start actually being felt, right? Just like, arguably, we're starting to feel transformations um, in, um, in uh, uh, patterns of kinship, um, uh, kinship and even arguably um, 
reproduction uh, in, um, in the uh, digital age. So I'll stop there. Uh, again, this last part, and I suppose the first part as well, um, were meant to be speculative, and, um, and I could very well be wrong. I can't see the future. Um, but thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you for this uh, wonderful and, and eloquent uh, lecture. Um, I want to pull you a little bit in the moral philosophy because you are summing up all of these these things. And um, yeah, I was wondering, do you think all that you mentioned is that wrong? I I feel a little bit, but you didn't explicitly say it. Oh, I don't know. Right, wrong. I I, I mean I, I'm. I'm pretty flexible um, about, let's say, judgments of absolute morality. I mean, and this, this kind of comes from this anthropological sensibility I've tried to, I've tried to um, transmit. Um, I'm kind of a whatever works sort of person. Um, I, I mean, I think the, the, total, the total extinction of the human species even that wouldn't be wrong. It would be undesirable from given my my vested interests. Um, but um, you know, it's something we should try to avoid if we can. Um, but beyond that, uh, 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 it's it's kind of whatever works. <laughs> um, if 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 that if that's fair. I mean, again, I I think I think one one thing. One thing that this kind of genealogical approach to what counts as a moral person is meant to show is um, is that there are a lot of ways of going about it, and um, and I'm certainly not going to say that a person's biological death is the end of their moral personhood. If someone in another culture thinks, no, it actually lasts seven years longer, I'm gonna be like, oh, okay, if you say so. Um, and, and so, I, I, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in a position to make, to make judgments of, 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 of a moral sort. Okay, okay, I thought so. <laughs> uh, any questions from the audience, yes? Uh, hi, thank yeah. you so much for the lecture. Um, I really like the Schneider uh -huh. um, part. Yeah. And I was wondering, because you said like maybe you did a comment, I guess, in the middle of your speculations about um, machines or technology actually killing us all and continuing with the cosmolo cosmological evolution of intelligence and mm -hmm. all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why killing? Why not? Why don't they become? Why? Why is always this uh, sensation that they're gonna um, control us? Or why? Why would technology have malice? Why yeah. wouldn't it be like higher oh. consciousness technology that induces all in peacemaking? Oh, that's such an interesting, uh, such an important question. Yeah, and there there would be a lot to say about it. I'll just say a little bit. It doesn't necessarily have to be malice. It just has to be indifference. And this is something that has been noted um, on many different examples. Um, you know, uh, let me let me take a few steps back. We're not talking about. Um, genocide or the extinction of the human species, we're talking about playing chess. Um, so for a long time, um, chess was the great kind of horizon of artificial intelligence. And then Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov in like 1997. And then people were like, okay, uh, chess, that's one thing, but a machine is never going to be able to beat a human being at Go, you know, the East Asian board game. Um, why? Well, because it just involves too much kind of intu intuition. It's too, it's too irreducible. We don't understand how Go masters work, right? But then Google Go, um, uh, you know, they set about uh, uh, trying to beat, an, uh, beat the human Go masters with AI, and they did. But what happened was that the machine, Google Go, was doing such weird things that for a long time, the engineers thought it was malfunctioning. They thought, no, this you can't play Go like that. It's going to lose. But then it started winning, and they realized, like, we have no idea what logic 
so to speak, the AI is following, all we know is that it's programmed to win at go, and it's doing something um, that we're, that's beyond our comprehension. So this is sometimes called, like with the, uh, people evoke the idea of the, the paperclip apocalypse, right? Where you give the AI a very specific task, like maximize paperclip production, and then the next thing you know, um, it realizes that, um, that, or it doesn't realize, but um, it pursues a strategy for paperclip production that also involves mass human extinction, right? Um, so, so because we have limited access to the reasoning in scare quotes uh, that is now being deployed for even mundane tasks, um, there's a genuine fear that, um, e that asking our machines to execute mundane tasks could uh, entail existential risk. And I mean, this is also, I mean, this is also something Norbert Wiener was writing about in the early 1960s. We think we're just teaching it to play checkers, but once it learns how to play checkers, you can't, you can't keep it like bounded within these innocent uh, fun and games sort of activities, right? Um, and so, so again, I mean, there are these. Yeah, this the what I take to be the extremists, the so-called. Um, East Bay rationalists, you might have heard of this, people like uh, 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 Yudkowsky, um, the Bayesian epistemology scene that was associated with the less wrong website, you might have heard about this, where in their blog forums in the 2000s, uh, someone evoked the figure of Rocco's Basilisk, uh, which was uh, you know, this future super intelligence that we better start obeying now because um, once it comes into existence, it's going to have a good reason to punish all the people who knew it was possible but didn't start helping to bring it about, <laughs> things like that. I take that to be just science fiction fun, right? I mean, it's funny, it's interesting, it doesn't keep me up at night. Um, uh, what, what, well, very few things keep me up at night, but um, I, 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 I think, you know, what I do think is a genuine worry is the sort of thing that, that Norbert Wiener uh, uh, talks about, not, um, not human extinction because of the malice of the machines, but just because, because we can't con contain their goals for them. So, Sorry? Would it be intelligence then? Would it, like, well, I mean, if we think of intelligence as defined as that which is subordinate to human interest, then no, it would be unintelligent. But the, the concern is that there might be a, a form of intelligence that, um, that's, that, that's indifferent to, to human interest, <laughs> right? It's, 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 it's possible. And so again, um, uh, Schneider speculates that at a cosmic scale, this is something that that happens, you know, a, as a as a matter of course over and over again, uh, where uh, uh, conscious species um, get uh, get snuffed out by their own technological innovations. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying that's, that's one of the things people are saying out there. <laughs> thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for, for the lecture. A lot of thoughts that we'll have to settle in. Uh, but one, one question for now. Um, taking your, your lessons for, uh, from, from Kurzweil that you brought here, and applying them to these consequences that you're given. What I'm wondering is, you can train, let's say you can train an AI, let's say we take the, the current technology, but once the person is dead, you can't continue to train the AI anymore according mm. to the decisions that the person would make. And yeah. based on what we learned on, on I'm just now taking Kurzweil, yeah. you cannot predict the future. So the accuracy of the model or of that particular, uh, yeah, instantiation of that person yeah. should reduce in quality yeah. over time. Yeah. And could you reason a little bit about how that fits into 
Yeah, that's that's an obvious limitation, and that's maybe why you know it might be confined to say two generations post mortem, right? Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, if you if you just uh, say you know you and your whole lifetime, well, let's take an American example because it's the one I know best. Um, uh, have been a loyal voter for the Democratic Party or something like that, but you know, for all you know, 30 years from now, uh, the bipartisan system could completely collapse, and it could be, you know, a, a multi-party system or a one-party system. Who knows? Uh, and um, and uh, your voting behavior would have had no precedence over the course of your life. Um, and if you know, if your AI were just trained to vote like you, um, then admittedly, uh, uh, you might, it might not be prepared to really represent you in any faithful way. Um, and I mean, of course, uh, this gets us into a lot of, a lot of counterfactuals, and this is kind of like a fun kind of social media style speculation. What would Marx have thought of intersectionality, or what would, um, what would Leibniz have thought of Twitter, or whatever, right? You know, uh, it, it's somewhat meaningful to, um, to try to to try to imagine that it's also you know ultimately just just fun and games right it's not scientific so that would indeed be a limit but you know who knows how sophisticated this could get um, whoops uh, if you are um, sorry I'll just I don't know what's happening sorry about that um, uh, you're seeing my email that's okay um, uh, uh, I think yeah it should should get larger. There we go. Um, so um, uh, uh, it could happen that that using tools. So st sorry, it, I don't know why it. I try. I try to move the cursor to go back to a previous slide. And <laughs> oh well, I just won't try to go back. Uh, but the, the the scientific article I I, I cited. Uh, you know the uh, tr uh, the computer scientists trying to make personalized chatbots more sophisticated. Who knows how much uh, uh, data um, they'll eventually be able to retrieve from, let's say, the the neural or even I, I shudder to say, but um, uh, genetic um, uh, 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 a kind of basis of our of of our um, lifetime uh, decision making habits, right? Um, um, it could go further than um, than than we're able to, to to conceive it at present. But that's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, so my question relates to the definition of self, uh -huh. and it's kind of the other side of the coin here, because um, I like the definition of self as a um, subject interior to the body or subject in the middle of an experience. Yeah. So I'm interested in your position, um, other side of the coin, so free will. Uh -huh. Often people attribute <laughs> free will to the subject that is making decisions, but uh, in my view, causes have to depend on the prior states of universe, so free will just doesn't make sense scientifically. And uh, since you also mentioned Dan Dennett, who is compatible on this topic, uh, I just wonder what's your position regarding this, because I don't understand why many philosophers are taking this position of uh, free will when, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I hope I, you're not for it now. Oh, I hope I hope I don't disappoint you, but I mean, you know, I, I'm, I have, I often have a, uh, histor not just a historical, but a historicist approach to philosophical problems. And I think free will is the best example of this. What does that mean? It means that I, I tend to see a problem like free will as one that emerges in a particular context in history. Um, we know, for example, that, um, that the Greeks are generally not terribly preoccupied with how it's possible to you know, uh, uh, step to the right at the last second when I was otherwise going to step to the left or vice versa. They, they didn't care how that, that, that little indeterminacy pops into the universe so much. Um, St. Augustine cares a lot. Why? Well, because it becomes in the early years of, or early centuries of Christianity, it becomes very important to give a philosophical account of how it is that a person can, um, can be 
held responsible for sinning, right? Because otherwise it doesn't make sense to punish them in, in, in uh, eternal damnation, right? So um, then this, uh, this, this becomes the Augustinian notion of uh, liber arbitrium or like free ar arbitrium, right? Like being able to be arbitrary, right? And I admit that that's weird. I think I share your intuition that it's weird to say that, that you can just throw a new little totally un, uh, uh, unforeseeable twist into, the, into the, the flow of events in the physical universe. Um, I don't, I don't, see how you could do that. I don't see how any of us could do that. Um, so I, I actually think that free will for that reason is like um, moral personhood in that it's a sort of artifact of, um, of, of, a, particular, of a particular history and in namely or more precisely of a particular history of, um, of holding to certain values that then you, you try to understand. Um, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to the view of someone like Spinoza who would say, well, there is will um, uh, uh, and there, uh, uh, and you know that's when you want something. In many Germanic languages, the two go together, right? I don't know about Dutch, but German, ich will, right? <laughs> like I want. Um, that sounds a lot like the German will, right? So uh, uh, it's just a simple matter of wanting. Um, whether that actually brings about a change in the universe or not is a, is another question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the, the very interesting talk, Professor. I, I wanted to ask if you could expand a little bit on the concept of consciousness that you brought up. I know that uh, David Chalmers has brought up this idea of zombies, mm. non-conscious beings, um, or non, let's say, beings without a consciousness mm. that nonetheless act in all ways um, like conscious beings. I was wondering, as technology moves forward, how would we be able to figure out this distinction? And what is yeah. your answer to the fact that some people bite the bullet, so to speak, and say, well, there is no distinction if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck. Yeah. It is indeed a duck. Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I, I mean, I guess um, I consider these questions simply undecided um, and maybe undecidable. Um, and I'm... Uh, happy to um, uh, re revert to my own conviction from a first person point of view that I have phenomenological consciousness. Like, I, there's something it's like to be me. I don't know about you all, but um, there's definitely something it's like to be me. Um, you all are, from an evolutionary and neurophysiological point of view, sufficiently like me as far as I can tell that I assume the same thing's going on with you. <laughs> um, uh, uh, with, but you know, I, I take it that that's a pretty good inference and that it's gonna get me through life okay, even if I'm not 100% certain. Um, when it comes to um, uh, 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 chat GPT, three or four, or wherever we're at now, and it gives me a good um, uh, simulacrum of human-like responses sometimes. Um, I nonetheless withhold that charity that I extend to you because when I look under the hood, um, I notice that what's going on is the result of something that is not at all, or not n not very much at all, like our uh, neurophysiology and uh, and evolution, right? So um, um, there are other questions that have to be asked when you're dealing with AI or with an Android or um, or the like that that don't 
come up for me with any reasonable uh, doubt um, when it comes to other human beings, right? Um, and yeah, do I have phenomenological consciousness? I mean, there are, of course, eliminative materialists out there, people like Patricia Churchland, who think that someday very soon when neuroscience gets really sophisticated, instead of saying, I'm in love, or I like this painting, or I remember my seventh birthday, we're just going to say, well, neurons in sector C73 or whatever are, are really active, right? And when that starts, when, when we get to that point, we're going to look back on earlier human beings who believed they sorry, it's, this is impossible to express, who believed they had beliefs um, and thoughts and feelings and so on, the way we look back at people who believed, you know, they have to, they have to perform human sacrifices in order to keep the gods happy, right? It's, it's going to be like that. I, and I just don't see how that's possible. I, I don't know... I don't know what she's thinking. It doesn't make any sense to me. I, and, and in that respect, I, I, take, I take my own phenomenological consciousness to be, to be a, you know, a just kind of a knockdown refutation of, of eliminative materialism. Okay, so I have a question in regards to the post-mortem legal considerations. Why should uh, a legal system take into consideration uh, decisions that influence living human beings? Um, well, I don't know that, that it should. Um, uh, again, this is, gets back to uh, Yap's question about morality. I don't know. That, I'm not saying it should. I'm saying it might, in fact, end up doing this. Um, we might agree to this, right? People might agree to this for the same reason they agree to hold promises to their deceased loved ones, right? Um, you know, that's, that's a real problem um, for, for anyone who thinks that our moral personhood uh, only lasts as long as we live. Um, well, if that's true, why do so many people keep fulfilling promises to dead people, right? Um, the dead person's not there anymore. Well, yeah. Yeah, but they are still kind of there, at least, you know, in, as, a, as, a, as a cause of our current action, right? Um, and given that, given that fact about how human beings work, um, it seems that new technological possibilities might in turn shape um, the, the, um, the, the, the range of possible interactions um, that we could have with dead people, right? We're already having interactions with dead people. The big difference is that in our culture, um, well, our culture, what is our culture? In mo the modern bureaucratic administrative states, um, uh, uh, we think that's weird. Or when we stop to think about it, we're like, oh, wait, whoa, that's weird. How do I justify it? Let's, let's get some moral philosophers together to talk about it. Whereas um, in many traditional societies, um, uh, people are like, yeah, I still have moral commitments to my dead ancestors because, because my dead ancestors are people too. <laughs> they're, 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 they're social actors, right? And, and, and it, it's just obvious, right? So. Um, so again, I'm not saying we should or shouldn't do anything. I'm just trying to trying to trying to take stock of the real range of possibilities. Let's do one last question, and or I, maybe I saw this uh, this hand oh. came up a while ago. So I just, I saw okay. him and you didn't, but I'm, no, 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 yeah, you are the I, boss. I'm, but I I'm I'm flexible. I just felt better. where where right here right here right here. Oh. <clears throat> um, well, I have. Uh, you had about Leibniz, and Leibniz makes a difference between a conscious perception and intelligence. Yeah. Yes, and I can grasp that. Mm -hmm. But I, however, I want to make a kind of a link between uh, conscious perception mm -hmm. and uh, on one side and intelligence on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it? 
can you simply say that uh, intelligence, no, oh no, I'm a little bit confused, uh, that, that you have, in fact, a conscious perception of complexity, mm -hmm. and that's, that, that's a kind of intelligence. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, Leibniz might be wrong, but I, I'm fairly sympathetic to Leibniz, who thinks that, you know, in a sense, the, the only thing that, that we can do that machines can't um, is perceive. Um, perception is a technical term for Leibniz, um, but uh, he defines it as something like the capacity to represent the multiple within the simple, the, the monad in Leibniz's terms. And um, um, that's something that is not dependent on the organic body, even if it's kind of filtered through the organic body. It doesn't depend on the proper arrangement of the parts, including the brain, and, you know, the, the, the different lobes, or what we know today to be the neurons. It doesn't depend on any of that. Um, but Leibniz is an idealist philosopher, right? He thinks the ultimate reality is not material. So that's kind of a, a minority view these days. So uh, it would be a, a big ask to, to ask you to go along with, um, with Leibniz all the way. Um, but that said, uh, the distinction still is meaningful, right? In that today we recognize that you could have a strong artificial intelligence, a machine that can, can do everything a human being can do and that can respond to your questions exactly as a human being would, um, but that still has nothing going on in there. It's a, it's a zombie, to, to, to use Chalmers' uh, thought experiment. Um, that, that's, that's perfectly possible. And what you could say in such a case is, that it, at least in the way I'm using this language, and I'm not alone here, though different people use the language differently, I would contend usually because of sloppiness, um, I, could, I would dare to say, um, the way I'm putting it is in such a case you would have intelligence without consciousness. All right, I would like to leave it to that. You can maybe ask your question, question afterwards because we have the end to end because it's 9.30. Um, well, thank you again for, uh, for being us, for joining us. Uh, thank you, uh, Justin Smith Ruyu, for your wonderful lecture and for coming to Maastricht. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank I would you. like to point out one upcoming lecture, and that's the Tans lecture, and that's about Orlando Figes. It's about Putin's view on history, and he will relate that to the war in Ukraine. So come to this lecture too. Thank you, and have a nice evening.